our microwave sensors. Um, essentially, the way microwaves work is when you've got a bi-static microwave link, that means you've got a transmitter and receiver. When you turn them on, it sends that, that uh, microwave energy from transmit to receive, and it connects boresight, that first little signal when it connects to each other. Our microwaves do what's called a phase-locked loop. Uh, the phase-locked loop is when the transmitter, it generates a signal. On our X-band microwaves, it's 10.525 gigahertz. On our K-band microwaves, it's 25.125 gigahertz. All right, so that crystal oscillator, that gun diode in there, generates that signal and shoots it out. On the receiver, it's the exact same parabolic dish. It's the exact same oscillation chamber. It's generating the exact same signal as the transmitter is. It receives that signal, and it compares the two. If it's the first time it's being turned on, it locks those two in phase, and that thereby creating a locked loop. Receive signal, comparator, constantly moving, constantly going in that receive side. The receiver is where all the brains is in our microwaves. Transmitters, their entire responsibility is generate a signal and send it, okay? So when I talk about microwave, I always try to relate it to field of sight, my vision, right? So when I first open my eyes, if I'm looking at that sun, I've got that sun on that picture back there, crystal clear, that's my alignment, right? Now if I move my head and keep my eyes straight, the further I get from that sun, the worse my vision is to see it. But if I'm looking right at that sun, Everything's clear all the way up until right about here, things start getting fuzzy for me. I can't really see faces. I can see faces in this range, but I can't really see faces over here. And then this is all peripheral all the way back until about right here for me. Can't see my hands anymore. But if I wiggle my fingers, I can see that motion movement. This area, all the way through to this area, is a Fresnel zone. F-R-E-S-N-E-L, Fresnel zone. Microwaves have Fresnel zones. You have your bore site, you have the general area around that bore site, and then you have dissipated RF energy, and then you have all the RF energy that's still out there that doesn't even matter, okay? Very similar to Microtrack, we're dealing in RF here, right? So my field of view is this. The microwave has a parabolic dish. That parabolic dish defines its field of view. So what you end up with is kind of like a cigar-shaped field. Wide in the middle, very, very narrow at the ends. And then below each microwave, you've got a dead spot. So this dead spot, if they're installed appropriately, that's about 36 inches or so high, about three feet off the ground, that dead zone's gonna be about 12 to 15 feet. Crawl right under it, not be detected at all because it's outside its field of view. Imagine if I'm looking up at that sky and somebody walked right, right below right here, right? I can't see them, they're out, outside my field of view, especially if they're crawling really slow. So we overlap the microwaves, right? This field is determined by two things, the sensor and the distance between transmitter and receiver. Those are the only two things that define how wide or how big that detection field is. That microwave field is not adjusted by the sensitivity. It never changes. Everybody understand that? Everybody online with that? Everybody just push the I believe button and, and believe it. When you adjust sensitivity, you're adjusting the area of detection. You're not adjusting the microwave field. So if you think, oh, I got a really narrow area, I'll just make it really low sensitivity and make that field smaller. The microwave's still out there. Vehicle drives by, it's still gonna be in that field. Somebody walks by, they're still gonna be reflecting that energy. So you wanna pay attention when you're looking at these things, when you're talking about uh, putting them in in different places. That's something that we always pay attention to when we're, we're, uh, we're designing these systems. So I just got an industrial site here. We overlap at the intermediate overlaps. These are the straight lines, intermediates. And then we overlap at the corners. And the idea is to make sure that we've got enough overlap that somebody can't crawl underneath between the zones or walk around the sensor. You all probably use microwaves in uh, Sally port applications. You may have a single, you may have stacked. If you have stacked, one's gonna be at 12 inches, the other's gonna be at 36 inches. If they're not, you should probably test it to make sure they, they still detect. These guys back here, they all know what the spheres are. The metal sphere presents a radar cross section. The reason we overlap is to make sure that somebody can't slip through those areas. These are our vulnerable points. 
we use those metal spheres, which radar, represent radar cross-section, to, like you said, for microtrack, find a consistent way to test these things, a measurable way to test these things. And so the idea is that um, depending on what our threat is, depending on our threat definition, if we've just got a normal standard microwave single unit, it's for a hands and knees crawling, walking, running, and unassisted jumping target. Single microwave, hands and knees, walking, running, and jumping, single person target. If your threat definition, your risk assessment calls for a prone crawling target, someone laying down, this is my cross section standing up, my radar cross section. This is my radar cross section side to side. If I lay down and face you guys, this is my radar cross section, much smaller than me walking through the field. So if your threat detection calls for somebody prone crawling, laying down, facing the transmitter receiver, sliding or rolling through that sensor field, you absolutely must use this lower head. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? No, you can't take a single unit and make it lower and still detect the running jumping target. If you want, it, if the, you want to detect the running jumping target and the prone crawling target, you gotta use two. Otherwise, your sensitivity's gotta be so high that you're gonna have nuisance alarms every time it rains. And the idea with microwaves is we get the highest possible alignment signal with the lowest possible sensitivity setting. We want a high alignment signal. We want three or four volts in there, at least. Sensitivity, we want it 10, 20%. If you have sensitivity settings at 50% or more, you have problems. It should not be that way. Your microwave should not be 50% or more, especially if you've got these short zones. These microwaves, the K-band microwaves, can go up 1,500 feet. The X-band microwaves can go 600 feet. Of course, we're never gonna use them in that wide of a zone because we can't see that with a camera. You're never gonna get good resolution for a target at a 600 foot zone. So we always use them at usually 100 meters or so, or a 300 foot zone at max. When you align these microwaves, you go left and right, and you go up and down. Microwave energy reflects. If I wanted to, I can put a transmitter receiver right here, point them at that wall, and have a good zone all the way up to that wall. I can bounce them off that wall. You can use reflector plates. You can bounce these off buildings. You can bounce them around corners. Um, no, I didn't have my slide up there. I was gonna show you my reflector slide. But the idea here is that uh, with this RF energy, it starts narrow and it gets wider. If you're gonna use a reflector, if you wanna butt this up to a building, right? If we put the microwave head on the building and point it out into the zone, we have that big dead space. We can bring those back 30, 40 feet from that building, put a transmitter receiver on the same post and point them at that building, reflector plate there, and now we have a microwave zone that goes all the way up to the building, detect someone walking, crawling, running, trying to get through that area. So these are bi-static microwaves. Bi-static meaning two heads, stationary field, bi-static. Monostatic microwaves are transceivers. It is a transmitter and receiver built into the same head. Do you all use transceivers? 380s, 385s. Our new digital models are 395s, 390, 395. And now we have some, some PoE, some power over Ethernet versions. Um, the model 300s and 310s are going away. Eventually they will be gone. The analog microwaves are they're dead, they're going away. So the 334 takes place of the 300, that's our uh, X band. The 336 takes place of the 310, that's our K band. They are the same fit, form, and function. You can take an analog out, put a digital in, operate the same. RM83, plug into the back of it, see everything right there, same. The biggest difference is that there's now software attached to it. So when we're dealing with our transceivers, it sends that same sensor field out, but there's no receiver for it to couple onto. There's no phase lock loop there, okay? So it just sends that out and it waits on a Doppler shift on that signal to bounce back. So when you interact with this system, or with this, with this RF field, as you walk out there, it's sending those pulses and it's got a timer inside it. And it waits for a return. We call that a range cutoff. With the transceivers, you can adjust range and sensitivity. And it's 
always a little bit of a balance between the two, right? If we pointed out a fence, we don't want to detect the fence moving, but we want to detect when someone walks by that area. So we have to kind of finely tune and balance that range and sensitivity adjustment. If I go max range with minimum sensitivity, we won't detect all the way at the end of the field. If I go max sensitivity and minimum range, we won't detect beyond that area, but this will be too highly sensitive. So it takes a little bit of fine tuning to work through those. And it can be frustrating sometimes, but it's, it's worth it if you take the time to do it the right way. All kinds of fun applications you can do with transceivers. So this is the, uh, we use the Model 330 to take some of these videos. It uses the same uh, installation and service tool as the MicroTrack and the MicroNet 2. It's called the UIST, Universal Installation and Service Tool. Our Model 334 and 336 use a different tool, but it looks the same. So what you have is you have your alignment voltage. It shows you in real time here. Signal to noise threshold. If that's green, you're good. It turns yellow when it gets really noisy and red when there's an alarm. And this is live. So this is all moving in real time. You can see what's happening in the field. This is a time, right? So we're at 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, 40 seconds, and so on. And this sine wave moves through here. So it's continually moving. I want to give you guys an idea of what we're looking at before I push play. Microwaves are set here and they run about 400 foot. So this is about a 400 foot zone. So as you can see, the sensor is showing you normal static air and then when we start moving into the sensor field, it starts showing a response. Most other manufacturers only see a dip in the signal. They only measure a drop in the signal. We measure both a positive and a negative on that RF field because we want to make sure that we're not tuning anything out. So you can see as we entered that field, it had a bump, it passed through that alarm threshold and the alarm was generated. Up at the top it shows an alarm and then of, of, on the right hand side up here we have a few different settings. And one of the cool things about the digital microwaves is that we can choose. I want to only detect fast things or I only want to detect slow things. Uh, we also have what's called an FSA, which is a Fresnel suppression algorithm. Remember when I first started this, I said, clear line of sight and my Fresnel zones working our way out all the way until I can't see anything. Well, our Fresnel suppression algorithm is, is designed specifically to eliminate nuisance issues from high frequency vibrations perpendicular to the field and large reflections parallel to the field. So I'll show you a video on that here in a second. So this is a hands and knees crawl, slowly moving into the field. You can see our alignment voltage is moving, noise is there, we're in alarm. Obviously the microwaves work as intended. Uh, this is a visual representation of everything you couldn't see on the analog sensors. You'll notice that there's this little flat spot right here. This little flat spot is a 15 second time window for when the microwave resets. When it goes into alarm, it stops that. That way you don't have consistent recurring alarms while you're in the zone and while it's, while it's uh, trying to reset and find its balance. That way it's not just alarm, 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 overwhelming your system. So general rules of microwave, flat terrain. Uh, of course, in your sites, you're not really worried about bumps or dips or you know, holes in your sensor field. Uh, but we like to see plus or minus, I'd like to see three inches, but uh, plus or minus six inches is, is plenty good enough to have a, a good well operating microwave system. Um, single head is installed about 36 inches high and we want to see clear space. Again, I'd like 30 feet. I'd love 30 feet in all the microwave zones. But one of the cool things about our digital microwaves is that we can put those right next to fences and not get alarms from, uh, from that fence movement because of that Fresnel suppression algorithm. The FSA actually does some really cool things on, the, on these microwaves. But you have to remember, we're using digital signal processing to process the RF field and responses within that microwave field. So it takes a little bit of time. I'm not talking seconds, but when you walk into that field, if you have someone run through there, it's not going to alarm as they're running through, right? As, as soon as they get past the field, you're gonna get some alarms from that. But it's not gonna alarm as they enter that field because it has to process what's happening there. I'm not sure if y'all do run testing on your microwaves or not. You're probably more concerned with the, the slow testing, the crawl, or like the slow walk, something like that. But um, uh, these microwaves, if you put the digital in and you see a very slight time delay, don't be concerned. It's the digital signal processing doing what it's supposed to be doing. 
You'll see here, I've listed the Fresnel suppression algorithm. Um, below that, I've got path alarm. This is something that's also new and unique to our digital microwaves. The path alarm measures the alignment path. So it takes whatever alignment signal that was uh, developed when you align the microwave, and it puts a buffer on either side of that. And it says, if my alignment goes up or down within a certain range for an extended period of time, like Tom said, what if snow starts to build up in the field? Well, that's gonna adjust the alignment signal because that's a bunch of water in the field. Well, if that goes outside of that threshold for, I think it's 15 seconds is our buffer. If it's outside that predefined threshold for 15 seconds, you get a path alarm. That will tell you that there's something in the alignment path of the microwave that has altered that field. It's not compromising the zone, but you should take a look at it. Maybe the grass is growing. Maybe there's snow in there. Maybe a truck parked really close to that sensor field, and now it's bouncing that RF field off of there, and the alignment signal or path has changed. So if someone is walking through and they're constantly, every day they throw some stuff into the sensor field, and over time that builds up and maybe it creates a little mound, the alignment path will change, and this alignment path will give you that indication. It's completely separate of the actual zone alarm. So, like I said, this is, what the, uh, this is what the software looks like. Normal screen, green line, uh, your alignment voltage is shown and it's got a, a value listed on there. Uh, this is what all of your zones should look like in normal operation. That little blue line should be moving. So, this is the target screen and this is showing your target. The line is moving. Uh, your indications up on top will show you all of the status indicators for the microwave, whether it's an alarm or not. Uh, the digital microwaves have six channels, whereas the analog microwaves had four. So this will tell you if it's in the wrong channel. That's the little, little uh, right there, that little guy. Uh, if someone's taking a high-powered antenna and pointing it at your microwave, trying to blind it, we got a little jamming indicator over there. Highly unlikely someone's going to be doing that. Um, but Air Force said they need it, so they got it. Uh, over here on the left, we've got different modes. Uh, you can synchronize these microwaves. So if you have a whole bunch in your field, say they're stacked five on a pole, you've got 50 zones in a row, synchronize them. That way they'll never interfere with each other. Um, the channel, like I said, there's six of them. You can tether these to where you can communicate transmitter receiver down your line. This is saying tethered yes or no. And then uh, you've got your recognition algorithm and your FSA, whether it's on or off. Um, at the bottom, sorry, go back, there we go. At the bottom, this is your gain setting. This is the sensitivity adjustment. The higher the gain, the more sensitive, the lower the gain, the less sensitive. On these microwaves, there's not little knobs. So instead of the potentiometers on the board, you actually go in the software and you make your adjustments here. For system testing, we still have the plug on the back. You still plug in your ARM83, none of that changes. But for tuning and troubleshooting, you can plug your laptop in and actually dig into it quite a bit. So again, here's our slow walk. You can see what it looks like when someone actually interacts with the sensor field itself. Um, this is pretty helpful if you're troubleshooting. If you're having nuisance alarms in an area, you can plug your laptop in and take a look at it. Um, with our digital microwaves, if you, are, if you build in a remote connection, if you put that RS-422 line into a remote area, then you can reach out to these remotely. Otherwise, you have to go out to the unit itself take the cover off, and then plug in your laptop directly to it. It uses a USB A to B cable, a basic printer cable. So this is what the alignment looks like. Uh, again, we've got all these indications on top, but now our main screen has changed. On the left-hand side here, when you do an alignment, and you click that Start Alignment button, and uh, this starts to move up and down. The neat thing about uh, our digital microwaves when you're doing alignment is it holds this value here. So it tells you what your max voltage was during your alignment. When we do an alignment, you start the transmitter. You go to the transmit side, you're doing a little left, a little right, a little up, a little down, until you've got your highest possible alignment voltage. Then you go to the receiver, and you do a left, right, up, and down to get the, the best alignment on those microwaves. It's important that when you're doing the alignment, at some point in time, step aside and look. Look at the side of it to make sure you're not pointing at the ground, because sometimes you can get a better alignment by bouncing the signal off the ground. You don't want to do that. Get as straight as possible. Get the best alignment signal possible. 
with the digital microwaves, because of our FSA and because of the path alignment, the, it's really hard to see, but this area here, this black line is our alignment signal at two volts, and then half a volt above it and half a volt below it is our alignment threshold. We've got that set at half a volt, okay? So with the digital microwaves, it is possible to have too strong of an alignment signal. If your alignment voltage is all the way up here at three, then there's no way to adjust your path alarm. There's no way to get those thresholds to where you can adjust them. So for those microwave techs in here, that little bitty end on the feed horn in the microwave is called a sensor element. That little disc on the front of those microwaves when you take the cover off, it's a little guy at the end of that sensor element. If you're at max alignment, if you're at two and a half volts or more on the digital microwaves, you're gonna take that feed horn, or you're gonna take that uh, sensor element off and you're gonna put the short range element on there. For the K-band models, it's real small. It's a little copper sticker. For the X-band models, it's a little bit bigger. It looks like a taco. Take the round disc off, put the taco on. Take the disc off, put the little sticker on. And that's how we're gonna adjust the alignment voltage for those really short zones. Because like I said, these can go pretty far. So when we do alignment, this is gonna go up and down, and this is gonna hold whatever our max voltage was. So it'll let you know when you hit that max peak. And then as you move around, it'll go up and down, up and down, and when you start getting higher, it'll move up and then hold it. Up and down, up and down, move up, and it'll hold it to, to help you out when you're doing your alignment. So those of that have done alignment, they'll understand. Uh, we've got several recognition algorithms. If you leave it at none, it acts just like an analog microwave. Leave the recognition algorithm at none, same thing as a model three, uh, 310 or 300. But when we start looking at changing these, that's when we start adding digital signal processing into it. And that's when we can start looking at slow, fast, or maximum security opens everything up. Um, the Fresnel suppression algorithm is unique. I've explained this a few times, but uh, here's your visual representation for it. Fresnel zones are on the edges or peripherals of the microwave field. If they're too close to a fence and that fence moves, it's gonna bounce that RF energy back in. If there is too close to a roadway and a big vehicle moves, it's gonna bounce that RF energy back in. And those when you start to get a nuisance alarms. The Fresnel suppression algorithm actually squelches that noise from high frequency perpendicular vibrations and large reflections moving in a parallel uh, direction. And here we've got a video on it. So at a, again, our test site, we set it up, this is a 400 foot long zone. And we took our microwave and put on a small tripod and we, the tripod is touching the fence here. So uh, what you're gonna see is a few different interactions with this fence. First, FSA off and the fence is shaking. We've got a guy standing out there shaking the fence really hard. And you can see, of course, it picked it right up and we had an alarm nearly immediately. Um, the next thing we do is we turn the FSA on and we shake the fence. You notice that before we turn the FSA on, it will look like that, and after it kind of looks like this. If the FSA is on, you're gonna see these little bumps randomly, all right? And so the third one, we've got the FSA on, we're shaking the fence, we're creating noise, and then we walk into the sensor field just to prove that with the FSA on and shaking the fence, we can still get an alarm from that. Pretty neat, huh? And there's not another microwave on the planet that can do this. I'm, I'm excited by it. Like, yeah. Yeah, but it's, uh, we, with our digital signal processing, we view, or our processors view the microwave field in a three-dimensional plane. So, a fast moving target affects this part, slow moving target affects this part, vibration affects this part, and we're able to, to tune and, and adjust each of those independently of each other. It's pretty cool stuff. Oh. So uh, this is showing path alarm. Like I said before, that black line will be straight. Uh, what we're showing here is that, that alignment voltage has gone down and down and down, past that area, and then creates an alarm from it. So here's some uh, descriptions kind of showing what that is in a visual way. Put a big vehicle in here, it's gonna reflect that signal. Park a container next to the microwave field, it's gonna affect that signal. Anything that's large that's gonna be in that area is gonna affect that signal and create a, uh, a change in the alignment signal. And so uh, here we've got a truck parked in the sensor field and it's creating a path alarm. This is an alignment path alarm, right? So we drove the truck, we parked it in the field and we let it sit. 
the zone is still active. It hasn't affected sensor performance or sensor operation at all, but the alignment signal has changed. So it's trying to alert us saying, hey, come take a look. There's something wrong with my sensor field. And so just to show the sensor actually still works, even though it's in path alarm, it's completely separate of the actual zone alarm. Make sense? Uh, like I said, the 334 is our X-band model. It's a direct replacement for the model 300B. The 336 is a direct replacement of the model 310B. Now, the biggest difference there is the size of the field. At max range, at maximum sensitivity, the 310 can be 1,500 foot at 40 foot wide. The 300 is at 600 foot at 40 foot wide. So I wanna say it's like a seven and a half degree offset versus a 10 and a half degree offset between the, the two different parabolic dishes and their field sizes. Um, that doesn't change by changing the sensor element. It doesn't change the field size. That field size is determined by the parabolic dish. The only time it changes is if you use the short range sensor element because that takes off that reflector and, and it just splashes the microwave energy and that's for really, really, really short zones. The MB65 mounting brackets have these four bolts. They hold the microwave head in place. If you're not using the MB65 mounting brackets, use them. It is worth the difference in cost. The MB62 mounting brackets have one bolt, one swivel nut in the middle of them. And eventually, over time, they'll either rust totally solid through, I'm talking 20, 30 years, or they can sag. So the MB65 mounting brackets are the way to go. Also, I don't know if y'all use latch kits or not, but if you're in and out of your microwaves often, such as like nuclear plants, they go out there and they're in their zones all the time. We have these latch kits. So those six magical disappearing screws that we use to hold our radomes in place, you know, I call them magical disappearing screws because if you're not actually holding it, it's gone, totally gone. Um, we put latch kits on them. So these are thumb kits. We just flip them open with your thumb, radome comes right off. They actually attach to the base plate. So these are, I want to say they're like 75 bucks for a latch kit and uh, we can install them at the factory for you if you want to order those when you order microwaves. We also have uh, enhanced radar antennas and some weatherproof junction boxes that we can go with them. Um, Y'all probably just buy the microwaves themselves. Uh, I don't know if you use our Hyrel versions or not, but how many people in here have heard of Hyrel microwaves? The Hyrel microwaves, it, it stands for high reliability, all right? It's our standard sensor, but it comes with a few different options included. They're a little bit more expensive, but they're burnt in in the factory. They go through an extended elevated temperature testing. So we have a big oven. We've got these racks. We stack our high rails in, we turn them on, and we have relays that activate. Click, 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 on, off. And they sit in there for an extended time period at an extended temperature for like a burn in, okay? And so they're fully tested, fully vetted in the factory at this extended temperature. Then they're taken out of there and thrown in our freezer. And we do the same thing in our freezer. We freeze them and then we run them. And then we, they go through all the testing again. The oscillation chamber is verified the RF signal and everything is verified. It's all done in-house before you get it out in the field. So all of our nuclear customers, they all use the high rail microwaves. Um, they come with a uh, shielded radome. So the radome itself, the cover on the microwave, has a metal shielding on the inside of it that completely encapsulates the electronics to absolutely prevent any issues with EMI or RFI. So that's electromagnetic interference or radio frequency interference for those of you who don't know what EMI or RFI is. So a little bit more expensive, but uh, in my opinion, worth the money. Uh, if you're in an environment where it's always wet, where it's raining, 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 where it's super humid and you have water that's constantly dripping off the radome, we also have hydrophobic coated radomes. So if that's your environment and you want radomes that are intended to be in those wet environments, a hydrophobic coating we put on there uh, completely eliminates water buildup and uh, dryness from affecting those, wetness from affecting those. That's a real microwave, it's really in use. That's at a hydroelectric plant in Siberia. Now, that's a functional microwave at a water inlet. Pretty cool. That thing is like this big around, kicked and nice. Um, some unique little rooftop applications. And we had a customer in Texas uh, build these for rapid deployment. That's an umbrella base. They just mounted a pole to an umbrella base. And whenever they have uh, uh, equipment or like spools of cable delivered, they just roll out four of those and they're transceivers, so it's a 380 on each of these posts. 
and they just turn them on and, and they've got a cell connection to them that uh, alerts, alerts their pager if someone passes that. That way they can have these uh, expensive equipment and materials out in their field and create a rapidly deployable microwave zone around it. So it's kind of a cool thing. Um, like I said, they're really low voltage and low amps, so it's easy to do. How many of y'all have seen this one? The one in the middle there. That's an explosion proof enclosure. So the idea there is it's not meant to be blast proof, but I mean, technically it, it is. That's a heavy, it's like 60 pounds. It's got bolts all around it. And this is glass on the front. The idea here is it's intrinsically safe. So everything's encapsulated inside that. So if you have an intrinsically safe zone or a zone where there's uh, volatile gases or things like that that may explode, this is what we call an explosion proof microwave. So we've got options for pretty much anything you guys can think of. Uh, you can, any microwave, any of our microwaves can shoot through fences, multiple fences. And the reality is, is that microwave is very similar to your vision. If you can see through it, through those fences, if you can get a clear line of sight from transmitter to receiver, you can shoot a microwave through it. So the Model 310 or the Model 336, 10 fence panels, 20 fence panels, 100 fence panels, as long as you have clear line of sight. If you don't, if they're impeding the vision, if they're impeding that line of sight, the more that's in there is gonna cause more reflections and more interference. So two, three fence panels, no issue. Um, Sally ports are typically two, two fences on either side. You take the microbes, put them outside that, and then shoot through it. Never an issue with that. Um, if you use those fences that have large posts or pickets, rather than a chain link, the more uh, of those pickets that are in the field of view is reflecting more of that energy. It's blocking more of that view. What they want is us to be conservative with our estimates. And they say, no more than two. We know that at Sally Ports, they're gonna shoot through two fences. Leave it at that, say that. That's a great question. Please send both. Please send both. We would love to see both transmitter and receiver when you send them back for repair or if you're troubleshooting and there's an issue. And the reason behind that is they're a paired link. It's because of that phase lock loop, right? So there's nothing to identify them from one to another. But if we're gonna troubleshoot, uh, we do two things. We have these boxes and they're isolation resonance chambers. And we take the head and we stick it on top of this box and point it down. And on the transmitter testing boxes, there's a receiver on the other side and that feeds into um, our oscilloscopes and our measuring equipment. On the receiver side, uh, there's a transmitter down there that shoots up, right? So it's, we can test each head individually. Then once we've tested each head individually, tested their, their RF signals and, and looked at the different test points on there, we actually take them outside into our backyard and we've got an asphalt area with uh, markings on it to measure distance. And we put them at what your, what your zone distance is and we actually test them live in the field to see what that looks like in a clear open, open area. So if you just send us one or just the other, when we take them outside, we have to pair it to a different device. And that's not a real true accurate representation of what your zone is. So it's, we'd like to see both if at all possible.